to it. Hello, I'm Duryan Hawk, aka Dea. I'm an Indonesian Pakistani non binary lesbian. Hi, I'm Marianne Salem, aka Mary. I'm a Lebanese Aboriginal bisexual woman. We are two writers who love movies, television, and books, especially when they're gay. And welcome to Gay Bee Club, where we will be analysing LGBT texts that we like, that we don't like, and how we relate to these texts as gay people of colour. It's your day. It is. It's my time. It is your time. I've been preparing my whole life for this moment. Welcome to episode two of volume two, where we are finally going to discuss, and this has actually been very requested on your Tumblr. I love this. We are finally going to discuss The Handmaiden. The 2016 film directed by Park Chan-wook, based on the novel by Sarah Waters Fingersmith. Yeah, the Korean gothic lesbian revenge thrill that captivated Khan. Yep. But didn't win anything. No. Hmm. It actually hasn't won a lot. This movie. It you, won my heart. It won your heart. That's the most important. <laughs> it won a BAFTA for best film not in the English language. Oh, true. I guess I just... It I won s- a bunch of Korean awards. I say well. not a lot, I guess, because I feel like this film deserves more recognition. Yeah. But, you know, you are always the one telling yeah. me, like, Western validation means nothing. But yeah. at the same time, yeah. like, it still is better it's than anything. It's still nice, though. Yeah. Anyway. Just a little rundown of the plot. With the help of an orphan pickpocket played by Kim tae a Korean con man devises an elaborate plot to seduce and bilk a Japanese lady, played by Kim In-hee, out of her inheritance. So just if you haven't seen The Handmaiden yet, go watch it as long as you're old enough. If you are old enough and you haven't seen it, what the fuck are you doing with your life? <laughs> um, just a heads up, in this episode we're probably going to be talking about Homophobia, lesbophobia, sexual assault, pedophilia, violence, child sex abuse. Also, probably going to talk a little bit candidly about lesbian sex. So, yep. just, um, <laughs> but also, if, if you're going to clutch your pearls, go away. I mean, we do rate this podcast as explicit most of the time because I swear too much. But um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, so you know, listen at your own discretion. If you haven't seen the Handmaiden, go watch it, enjoy it. Reflect on how your life has changed now and then come back. We'll yeah. still be here. Yeah. So, yes. But for everyone who's left, let's do it. Let's go. All right. So, I guess what I want to ask you, because this is your favorite movie. What were one you? One of my favorite movies. One it's of my favorite, favorite lesbian movie. But it's, I feel like you say that you have other favorite movies, but honestly, I don't see you like behave the way you do. I don't have nine about, other copies of my yeah, other favorite movies. So I feel like you're trying to be modest, but just, just admit to yourself it's your favorite movie. Just do it for me here in this room. It's my favorite movie. Oh, there we go. Round of applause for you. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so I want you to, because I remember. A time before this movie came out. I remember, like, you before this movie came yes. out. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and can you take me back to what you thought about it when you first, like, saw the trailer? Like, before you saw it, like, uh-huh. what were your thoughts? Because I know you were a fan of PCW before this. So what were your thoughts and feelings about it, if you can remember, before you saw it? Okay, so before I saw this, I, I've been a fan of Park Chan Wook for a very long time. I love all of his movies beforehand, so actually the first one I watched was I'm a Cyborg, but that's okay. I just watched that on SBS On Demand. <laughs> I just watched that one night on Shout SBS. Shout out to SBS On Demand. Thanks for having the content. No, it wasn't on demand back then, but it was just like on SBS TV, like SBS World Movies, that's what it oh, was. Oh, yeah. Um, and I just watched it because it was just like a funny, weird rom-com movie that was on TV, and then I watched Old Boy because everyone was saying, you have to watch Old Boy. Um... <laughs> And then I watched all of his other films and I watched Stoker because Mia. So basically I was always going to watch The Handmaiden anyway. I had no idea before watching this movie that it would actually be gay. Because I love this filmmaker so much, I really wanted to go in cold. So I remember deliberately not reading even the basic premise of this movie before I watched it. And whenever trailers were released, I didn't watch with subtitles. That is really cold. Yeah, really cold. I remember... The first trailer which was released, it's not it's not the good one though. It's not the best one. The first trailer was released and we were like, oh, this is interesting. And then the second trailer was released, that iconic one, the one that was edited amazingly. Oh um, yeah. Like with the song by Red Sex in it. Yep, yep, yep. And yep. um 
<laughs> Looking back, that trailer is like the biggest scam ever because from that trailer, I kind of assumed that it would be some kind of weird bondage sex thriller. That's what thriller. I thought it was. I thought that... it would be some weird bondage sex thriller and that like was the trailer. with like a black. And you know how there, there is a kiss in that trailer, and I was like, oh, it's just probably going to be like Black Swan gay. Like, yeah, whatever. I'll still enjoy it because it's my favorite filmmaker. Right. I was like, what? <laughs> You're like, I was. St- <laughs> All right. I suppose I'll tolerate this. <laughs> Yeah, I was excited. You were still excited even though you thought it was going to be... Like, yeah, I, I was uh, excited. Anyway, I just thought it would be like a regular thriller. I didn't think that it would be... Like, I didn't like, go into this thinking that it would be a lesbian film. You were like, I went to it, I'm like, this is a Park chan Wook film. You were so like, like, if yeah. someone's going to queer bait me, it may as well. No, I, I didn't even feel queer baited. I was just... I wasn't even like considering the fact that there would be any lesbian content that I would actually like invest myself in. Oh, as watching this movie okay i just watch it because i just love this filmmaker so much because i remember when i first saw i think i only saw that second trailer i don't remember the first trailer i just mm. remember the second not a lot of people remember and the I, first trailer and i remember thinking like oh this looks like oh god this is such a bad thing for me to think but i was like this is like like 50 shades of gray about period <laughs> drama i know with, with i thought that people. too i thought that too <laughs> i was like oh because okay. you know you see how like tied up and you see like the yeah. mannequin and like yeah, I was like, um, it's a good trailer. And I remember thinking, I don't want to watch this. <laughs> Even when you loved it, I was like, I still don't want to watch this. It looked really weird. Like, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I, my first impressions of the film, I was quite dismissive of it. Mm. If I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. It took me a while to come around to it because I was like, I don't know, that trailer looked real funky. <laughs> But okay, so then you thought all of this, even though you were seeing it cold, you still had all that impression. Yeah, I still had that impression. So I was just like, I'm just going to go see Park Chan Wook's new movie. And it was playing at Sydney Film Festival. I remember because I'd never actually been to Sydney Film Festival before 2016. Oh, wow. And I remember just like happening to see an ad that it was on. And I was like, wait, I should check if The Handmaiden is playing here. (laughs) And it was. And actually, because I just thought it was going to be a regular director park movie, I was like... Yeah, regular regular. I bought two tickets and I invited my straight best friend to go see it with me. Wow. She, like, wasn't available and I'm actually very relieved that she wasn't. Yeah. Because I was not expecting... (laughs) Yeah. I was not expecting it to be so romantic. Take me through, like, you're sitting in the theatre, this movie starts. Mm -hmm. What's going through your head as you watch it? Were you, like, literally like, holy crap? Were you internally screaming the whole time? Like, yeah. can you pinpoint the moment where you were like, holy crap, I love this movie? Yeah, absolutely, I can. There were many moments just when it was just, like, shockingly tender. Like, even in that first scene with Hiroko and Suki, like, when she, like, gets into bed with her and, like, starts, like, you know, singing her to sleep and stuff, I was like, hold on. Hold on. This is... Is this... Is this what this is this tenderness? Like, <laughs> I was like, this is, this is like, this is like actually romantic. What the fuck? And then... This yeah. is not Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> this is not... It wasn't at all what I expected it to be in part one of the movie. And then part two, the horror sets in. Because yeah. you actually have context for everything that Hidup has been through. Yeah. Because, you know her uncle has been forcing her to read and to porn. read and perform pornography yep. for men ever since she was a child. It's absolutely disgusting. It and is. it's like, it's, it's genuinely bad. like so sad and so horrific. It was just shocking. And then, yeah, the, the point where I was like, this is actually, I remember <laughs> I just, I looked at, cause I had Letterbox then and I looked back at my first ever review of the handmaid, like when I first watched it. Oh yeah. What was that? Like, June 19, 2016, or June, something, something around there. Your life is split in half. <laughs> I know. At that moment. I know. But like, the funny thing about that review is it how composed it is. <laughs> oh, and like, really? And like, I only gave it four and a half. Oh my God. Can you read it, please? Okay, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Dee is going to read us her first. Looking, in- looking back at it, it's so funny. It's kind of like, you know, you see those Twitter profiles of people and you see like people who have met on Twitter, they're like, these are our like first interactions on Twitter and they're just like, oh, hey, and they'll be like, oh, I think I like this guy or something like that. <laughs> or no, nah, he's got a stupid bedroom or something like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've logged this film 18 times. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Look at all those logs. No, those are reviews that I've liked as well. Okay. okay so my first, my first review, 19th of June, 2016. 
I was expecting this movie to mess me up like PCW normally does, but to my pleasant surprise, it was actually really charming and adorable most of the time. The chemistry between the two main actresses was really sweet, and the first two acts complemented each other so well, and everything was so elegant, so pretty, so gay, and so funny too. One of the best Wallowa films I've seen, and my new favourite period drama. I just wish someone had warned me about the giant fucking censored. And the censored bit was... The octopus. Can I just say, you know, for many, for ages I wondered what that asterisk was. And only last night when we were re-watching this movie um, and you just saying that now, I was like, oh my God, it's the octopus. Yeah. Like, I don't know what I thought that was yeah. before. I was like, oh, I wonder what this is. For people who don't know, I have a very traumatic experience from when I was two years old of being grabbed by an octopus. So yeah. it's, it's something that, like, octopus is just something that I've always been afraid of. Yep. So for this film to have a giant octopus, like, it felt like a personal attack. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, also, I, guess, I guess, I guess, possibly like that, like kind of like solidify. I'm like, oh my god, this movie is made for. But me. but maybe that's why as well. Maybe that's why when you first saw it, you yeah. only gave it four and a half stars. You were yeah. like, take away half stars. I was, I was scarred, honestly. <laughs> But I think as well, like, maybe you can take solace in the fact that the octopus wasn't there to look or be pretty. It was there to yeah, be evil. It was there which to be is evil. Which why, yeah. like, it reflects your attitude. Yeah, yeah. my phobia of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. that's very interesting. I don't know. I don't think that's as tame as you think it is. You mm-hmm. you you seem to be trying to restrain yourself. Yeah, it's like, I know. It's like my Good Omens review in Junkie. It's kind of like, you yeah. know, like, fake restraint. Like, yeah. Where I'm just like, please watch this! <laughs> David Tennant's walking so funny. Anyway, <laughs> we're not here to talk about that. Yeah. But you did love it from I, the very I moment. I did love it. Yeah. It wasn't one of those movies that grew on you. No. No. It was like I did love it. And then I think watching it for the second time really solidified it for me then. I was like, this is my favorite movie. When you watch it, do you feel like every time you love it more? Or has your love for it like plateaued? In the early rewatches, it's like I enjoyed it more and more each time because I would notice more. Mm-hmm. Now I think I'm I'm pretty certain I've noticed everything. Like I've picked it apart, but like I still love it so much. I'm very careful not to rewatch it too often. Yeah, like eighteen times in the past four years. <laughs> like I think that's, that's a pretty that's like, pretty even well, that's number. pretty restrained. You know, okay? I think that's pretty good. Like there are heaps of other movies that I have watched like way more than The Handmaiden. Is this the I movie? I try to like preserve the specialness. Yeah. Yeah. Is this a movie you show people, like, if someone said to you, like, show me one movie that tells me everything I need to know about you, is this a movie you'd show them? Uh, no, I'm really scared to show people this movie. Like, especially people that aren't gay. I'm kind of scared to show them this movie. Why? Because I feel like they don't, they don't get it. I'm a bit scared of that. Because, you know, like, when it came out, like, there were quite a few criticisms of it. And, like, I'm scared of, like, that first impression. I'm scared of having to, like, explain it. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to you know? we're gonna We will get to that. that. And I actually am going to explain it in this episode, but, so buckle but in. But that does sort of bring, like, <clears throat> the next thing I want to ask you is, like, because mm-hmm. this is something I was surprised at because I wasn't as, like, excited for this film. I've never really watched many PC. I don't think, I think this is the you've only, only one seen, I've seen. You've only seen Stoker. Yeah. Oh, and this, yeah. So I've only seen Stoker and this one. Ooh, so yeah. I don't think I've seen any others. Mm-hmm. And, um... So I was surprised when you started giving The Handmaiden and telling me about it, I assumed that it must have been made, like, even after I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, I am the dumbass. I'm the resident dumbass of this podcast. And I was like, oh, a woman had to have made this because, like, it's just so, it's dealing with so much stuff, particularly from a woman's point of view, that Mm -hmm. I assumed, like, oh, a man couldn't do this, you know? <laughs> I was like, a man cannot do this. But, like, why do you think mm-hmm. that this that he does this so well? Like, and do you think he does it well? Yeah, okay. So I think the first important thing to notice is, yes, he directed it, but the screenplay is actually by a woman named Chung So Kyung. Oh. So she's the one who adapted it from Sarah Waters' Fingersmith novel. Sarah Waters is an out lesbian. I don't actually know so much about Chung So Kyung, but, like, I've read, like, many interviews with her and with director Park about, like, the discussions that they had with Sarah Waters wow. on, like, adapting, on making this story and also just, like, the fact that they consulted a lot of Chung So Kyung's lesbian friends. Nice. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I'm like, how many lesbian friends do you have, Chung So Kyung? 
Nice. I'm like, I love that. I like I li- that. I like that for yeah. her. Good for her. <laughs> you know, I wish more writers would do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is important to note that, yeah, he's not the only person behind yeah. this story. Another thing to remember is that Director Park, like, he's been making amazing films with amazingly well written female characters in them since Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, Faith and I's character in that, you know, Son from Sensei. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she is excellent in this movie, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance from 2002. Then he released Old Boy. It's cool in interviews about The Handmaiden when he's looking back at Old Boy, which is like his most popular film in the West. Oh, right. He says. I've heard of Old Boy. Yeah, he, the thing about Old Boy is it's not particularly feminist at all. Right. Um, like he, he looked back at it and he, he's, he says he's kind of embarrassed by it because the only woman in the film doesn't actually know the truth. And uh, so since then, so she's a since, fence. yeah. So since making that film, he has actually doubled down to work hard. So like pretty much all of his films either have a woman protagonist or they have you know a woman character who is basically the protagonist in like most uh, of his films. He became an ally. Yeah, I feel mm-hmm. like one of the most offensive things I see written about PCW is that he's like the Asian Quentin Tarantino. I hate that so much. Uh, sorry um some people think it's more accurate to call him like the asian hitchcock but i i disagree with calling any asian filmmaker like the asian equivalent of anyone that works in the west yeah because if anything yeah people in the west like Mm. just steal yeah (laughs) just steal from asian cinema he did say maybe it has to do with the fact that as i get older i spend more time with my wife and daughter so i feel myself like becoming more mature and more fascinated and drawn to women's values so like yeah that's kind of that's an do you reckon his wife has seen this movie yeah probably (laughs) i'm a cyborg but that's okay it's a really it's a cute rom-com but it's about mental illness and um he made that movie because he realized he's like oh my god like my daughter actually isn't allowed to see any of my movies She's like she's not old enough yet. So he made that movie for her and it's it's really sweet. That reminds and, um, me of that's why Martin Scorsese made Hugo. Because he was like really? my kids can't see any of my movie, so I'm gonna make something for them. And he made Hugo. I mean Hugo sucks, but I like Hugo. It's okay. Nice. Okay. It's sweet. <laughs> yeah. So you've mentioned this is an adaptation. Mm-hmm. But it's an extremely different yes. from its like, do you want to talk about, like, how it's different from the book it was based on and how it's the same as well? Yeah. So, yeah. first of all, Fingersmith. It's a 2002 novel by Sarah Waters. Have and you it's read set, it? Yeah, I have read it. Yeah. And it's set in Victorian London, actually. Mm. So, it's kind of the same premise, exactly the same, but the story does deviate. The movie kind of, like, it's a very fat book. It's a thick boy. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like it's a very fat book, and like it took me ages to read, even though I was loving it because it's also so sad. Oh, so just like it's like very emotionally draining. The movie kind of cuts off maybe two thirds, no, maybe like halfway through the story. Oh, and it's just like you know what? Let's give them a happy ending. Oh, um, and bold. Yeah, but the story itself, in it, like the Suki equivalent, her name is Sue, and um, the Hidako equivalent, her name is Maud. And there's actually like a whole entire plot twist that they were actually switched at birth. So actually, Whoa. Sue is Maud, and Maud is Sue. Whoa. And it's actually like been orchestrated by gentlemen, like the Count character, and also her aunt character who look after her. It's actually like all been orchestrated so that they can get both of their fortunes. It's oh like my it's a sca- God. it was a scam that had was literally like eighteen years in the making. Holy crap! Yeah. That is a long game. Yeah, to it is play. a very long game. Oh my um, God! And it's quite sad because it doesn't go where where the story goes. Where they both realize where obviously Hidako knows that Suki is is scamming her, and then Suki like she is honest to her, and then they decide to work together. That doesn't actually happen. So, and even though, so even though Maud is in love with Sue, Maud is like, okay, but despite all this, despite all I'm feeling, like Sue is still going ahead of this, so I'm still going to do this to her. (gasps) It's so depressing. I do get that though. It's so sad. At the end of the book though, like they do kind of find each other anyway. Um, But but is it like the same kind of happy ending? It's not the same kind of happy ending because they have nothing. 
mostly. So yeah. like you know, kind of like the handmaid, like they run away and they had the money as well. They have everything. They have everything. Mm. Like it's a total win. Like it's it's, it's it's not bittersweet. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Just the way everything turns out at the end of the handmaiden. But at the end of Fingersmith, they have nothing, but they they find each other because they have nothing. Maud herself, who has this traumatizing upbringing where she doesn't really have any skills except for this, actually turns to writing her own pornography because. It's all that she knows. Really. Wow. That's a very depressing mm. way to finish this story. It's I'm glad. It's bleak. Yeah. But, like, everyone is dead, basically. All the men that hurt her are dead and everything. But, um, yeah. Wow. Ouch. Yeah. I'm glad that yeah. the Handmaiden... Yeah, the Handmaiden kind of cuts off. Like, it doesn't do that. So, basically, Hiroko and Suki, they confess to each other that they're scamming. And then they decide to work together instead. And it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I meant more like this. Obviously, like yeah. they so, were. Like, so that's so, um, that's the plot of the Fingersmith. Yeah. But the Handmaiden, it's obviously not set in Victorian London. It's <laughs> set in nineteen thirties Korea while it was occupied by Japan. So there's a lot of stuff about colonialism in this movie, even though it doesn't directly approach it because it's a backdrop. I was saying to you last night, like this movie. It's kind of like Roma in the sense that mm. if you don't know yeah. the history of what you're looking at, you can still appreciate it like as a movie. You're yeah. like, oh, yep, this is a great movie. Yeah. But if you know what's actually going on in the yeah. background, it's like a million times yeah. better and yeah. deeper. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, and I didn't know any of that mm-hmm. until you told me and I was like, oh, I get it. It's yeah. so much cooler. Yeah. So mm-hmm. why do you think PCW chose that time period like you could have just gone Mm. back further or could have said at any time why that time and how is that portrayed in the movie well i guess because the japanese occupation was an awful thing for korea at that time it was an awful thing for a lot of asia during world war ii japan colonized and like invaded so many east and southeast asian countries Mm. korea though is probably they probably got the worst of it because they were occupied for the longest from like 1905 up until the end of World War Two. Jeez. So it was it was really bad, and I do find it a little bit weird that not a lot of people talk about it. In fact, like the Japanese government like denies a lot of the shit. Yeah, it's not included in a lot of the histories. war crimes that that Japan has done. But like, yeah, I think it's specifically to show it's a horrific time. Like, I can't really speak to the Korean experience, but, like, it is, it was obviously a horrific time for them. I can't imagine being colonised is a good time for anybody. No, it's not a good time for anybody. <laughs> so that's what's happening in the macro world. But in the micro world, which is the story between these two women, it's shown through the use of language in Hidoko's world because all the books, like, all the pornography that her uncle forces her to read is in Japanese. When they did colonise all of these other countries, they forced... The people there to speak Japanese and they gave Japanese names. So, for instance, um, Suki, like her fake name is Okju, but they give her the name Tamako as an equivalent for that. And she has to speak Japanese. Like, language, it was a tool of colonialism and of oppression. Like, my grandmother in Indonesia, she actually knew how to speak Japanese because she lived during that time. Yeah. So, in, in The Handmaiden's case, that's reflected with Hideko who is forced to read all this, like, disgusting pornography in Japanese, which is why at the beginning of the movie she kind of says, all the books he makes me read are in Japanese, I don't want to speak it. So that's why she speaks yeah. Korean to Suki, because she knows that Suki is more comfortable speaking yeah, that She gets more mad, she's like, I hate Japanese, I don't want to read it. Yeah, like- there's a direct association of language with trauma and with colonial trauma. Which is also attached yeah. as she is sexually yeah. abused. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to speak Japanese either if I were her. Or if you were from any of those colonized countries. many of those colonized <laughs> yeah. countries in, in general. Yeah. But yeah, the use of language is quite interesting in the movie. I, I didn't pick it up the first time mm. I watched it because the subtitles I had didn't actually say yeah. when they were speaking you, Japanese and when they were speaking Korean. So I didn't pick mm-hmm. it up at all. It wasn't until I rewatched it yeah. and the subtitles actually were like in brackets, like in Korean. In, and I was like, oh, oh okay. okay. Yeah, in general, like most releases, they have yellow subtitles for Japanese and white for Korean, so you can tell. I did study Japanese for a bit, so I can tell which when they're speaking anyway. Like if I don't have it, but um, yeah, I can sort it's of. It's an interesting thing to notice when you watch the film. Like they've linked the language to evil, especially with the uncle in the final scene with the uncle and gentleman. Yeah, with the uncle and the count, he's realized oh, the count isn't actually 
Japanese. So he's speaking like Korean very casually to him. But when、yeah. he's excited, when he gets excited and when he's discussing very gross things in the pornography that he's reading, like he'll switch to Japanese. <sighs> Yeah, so the yeah. commentary of that. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. But yeah, that's why I think director Park and Chung Sa Kyung like chose that particular historical setting because it's a way of linking language to trauma to colonialism. Yeah, and this is a story about trauma,、mm. so why not make it a wider? Very much a story like about abuse. Yeah, why not really go in on that theme? You know,、yeah. if you're gonna make a story about trauma, may as well do the whole hog. That's what、mm-hmm. I always say. Yeah.、Um, but speaking. Of the director, one of the criticisms that is constantly levied at this movie, even I'm aware of this, which is always brought up with this movie. Yeah, yeah. always brought up with this movie. I don't see it brought up as much with other movies about、uh, white women, for instance, white with, lesbians. Yeah, for instance. I wasn't going to say it, but there you go. <laughs>、um, is this idea of the big monster that is the the male gaze? And that because there is、uh, what two, three, four sex scenes in this movie? Four? What? How many? Like, there's one. There's sec- one, but there's two sex scenes in this movie. One of them is split into two parts, so、yeah. you see two different them in two different contexts. Yeah, and yeah. the criticisms I see are like, it's like, well, this film's actually fine because it's yeah, it's very dis- dis- people dis- are very dismissive of it directed by a man and it's um, you know, the male gaze. But I feel like. And I know you do that. The male gaze is like a huge part of this movie,、yes. and like criticizing it is a huge part of. It's this a huge、movie. part of this story. Um, like it's ac- yeah, it's actually one of those instances. You know, when directors are like, "Oh, the reason this is included is like criticizing it, right?"、Mm-hmm. But it's actually one of those instances where a movie is doing that、yeah. and doing it well, but people still dismiss it. Yeah, this story and the book it's based on is literally about pornography and the violence of the male gaze. I did prepare a whole thing on this because I didn't want to. Prepared, I have so much to say. She prepared have, a TED talk for you. I did. I did. The first thing I do need to say is, first of all, is that people who say that the handmaiden is male gazy or voyeuristic really didn't get the point of the film. The film is specifically about the difference between the male gaze and the lesbian gaze.、Mm-hmm. Park Chan Wook he has described the handmaiden as his most violent film because it is about violent gaze and thinking. And he's specifically spoken about the reading scenes where a group of men hurt and sexually abuse Hitako without even touching her,、yep. and like also because the film deals with violence committed by adults towards children, he said that it's the worst crime that a person can ever commit, even if there is no physical contact. And I honestly. Agree with that, Sarah Waters. When she was asked about when Sarah she, Waters, the yeah, Sarah Waters, Sarah Waters, the author of Fingersmith, when she was asked when she was first approached to adapt, like she was kind of surprised, like she thought it was really random that some Koreans would want to adapt this story into a Korean story. But like she looked at Park Chan Wook's films, and they're very violent. And the thing is, the novel itself is very violent, and the actual Victorian era novels that inspired the Fingersmith were very violent. So it is about that. So the film specifically has those reading scenes of men forcing her to read them pornography and to even act out some of it. Those yeah, scenes were those speci- are hard to watch. Yeah, those scenes were specifically designed to show us the violence of the male gaze, even though there's no physical contact because, like, she has to perform for them. But for some reason, <laughs> and、oh. I will get and I will get to those reasons when Hideko, who has been subjected to all of this violence. Is alone in her bedroom with Suki, acting out her own sexual desires, not those of men, but like her own desires. People call that male gazy. <sighs> that... <laughs> so that being said, those scenes are really graphic. So we're gonna we're gonna unpack that. First of all, I think it is important to note that there were obvious ethical concerns for the well beings of the actresses. Especially so soon after the release of Blue Is the Warmest Color. Oh yeah.、Uh, as we were mentioned in our decade in review. Yeah, it's episode. The 2013 French scene features a graphic sex scene where the actresses were abused during the shoot, which was ten days long,、uh, because the director kind of just wanted to watch them together for his own pleasure, which is obviously disgusting. Yep.、Um, some people were worried about that situation happening again with the handmaiden. I'm relieved to say that it didn't. We know this because there were actually like several interviews where they were specifically asked about it and about the treatment of the actresses because obviously there was that concern.、Yes. So like the actresses were told exactly what was going to happen like for those scenes before the production even started. Yep. Um. So they weren't going into a blind. No.、Um, and the scene was shot in just the one day. 
I doubt they took the whole day, but like the actresses were given like time for themselves. There were actually no men on set that yeah. day, not even not even director Park. Apparently they even hired a female gaffer to work that day, and I'm like, why don't you have a female gaffer? Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> Seems yeah. like, I mean, you could have just had one. Uh, but yeah, so just that out of the way. So, you know, we we all know everyone had like a decent time. <laughs> um, yeah, like I don't think from what you've just described, that yeah. sounds like the most ethical way you can do yeah. that. It also kind of reminds me of like when, uh, you know, that inter-Rachel romance, uh, disobedience. Yes. Uh, Rachel and Rachel. Yes. The Rachels. Yeah, um, they edited that, they, those, yeah. the sex scenes themselves yeah, you because know? they wanted it. I know Desiree Alcabon has spoken about how in the films that she's been in that she's directed where there are sex scenes, like she prefers to be in the editing room and like in control of what's happened as well. That is a good thing, I think, of something that's come off like from that whole instance with Blues and Scarlet is that people, even critics, and like in, are very cognizant of like, well, mm-hmm. you know, there's this idea that you will be held accountable like or you yeah. really, like that there is that fear i think there's still that problem because the scrutiny is kind of only still only focused on lesbian films yes um, like i think you like with filming like straight sex scenes in a lot of movies like there have been some awful things happening oh, and God. i think yeah. it's like the stories that you hear it's you know People still have a long way to go. In general, I don't think most movies need a sex scene. Yeah. Like, I, I really don't. Like, most things really don't need it. Like, if you, if you actually need people to see your two characters having sex to, for, like, if this is the purpose you're putting it in for mm. is to make the audience see that they're in love, like, you haven't done your job. Like, mm. honestly, you haven't. Like, if you think that the audience isn't going to get it, like, unless it's there, Go and back to... Please watch Pride and Prejudice 2005. You know how thirsty they were? Oh, my God. You know how horny that movie is? It's the most horniest (laughs) movie. And they don't even... There's not a single kiss in it. Like, of like, there's not a single lip kiss in that whole movie. Except for the one they filmed afterwards. But we don't talk about that because... because... Yeah, (sighs) yeah. (laughs) But, no. But back to the red point. I I think this movie, the sex is important. Because it's, like, part of that dichotomy of... The lesbian gays and the male gays. Yes. So you can turn to your point. I'll circle okay, back. Back to, back to my TED talk. <laughs> yes, back to your TED talk. <laughs> Sorry, uh, intermission. So, you know, that aside, people just misunderstood the film. And I feel like this says a lot about how lesbians and bi women of colour especially are so poorly treated, represented in film, because a lot of the people criticising it in that way mm. were white. Um, yep. And there's... There's something about white people. I, I'm, I don't know if you can tell me what it is, but okay. like where they find it so difficult to separate women of color existing together and loving each other from pornographic and fetishist contexts. It's because of racism. Exactly. Like they're used to seeing lesbians, especially lesbians of color, especially Asians, completely hypersexualized as if we can only exist for the male gaze. Yeah. And this is really harmful because even though these and, criticisms... And also only exist for the white gays. Yes, and only exist for the white gays because even though these criticisms are supposedly given by feminists who seem to have good intentions, like this dismissal of lesbian sexuality and our own autonomous desires, it contributes to internalized lesbophobia. And I know for sure that some people who do or did believe that the film was male gazy are lesbians with internalized lesbophobia... I myself, when I first watched this film, I was 19. I had a lot of conflicting thoughts. Did you identify as a lesbian when you saw this movie? No, I didn't. Actually, back then I identified as bisexual. Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of conflicting thoughts about it and I had to spend like a long time actually determining how I really felt. And this is how I really feel. (laughs) You did some soul searching and here we are. Yeah, and here we are, like four years later. I'm I'm doing a whole podcast episode about it. Um, Proud of you and this growth. Yes, I know. Because the thing is, as one of my favourite quotes from this movie goes, men are disgusting. Mm. Um, Any lesbian sex scene, when taken out of context, can be turned into something for the male gaze. Gross straight men can watch these scenes, or even the entire film, and still jerk to it anyways. Unfortunately, nothing will stop them from doing that. Yeah, it's a fact of life, and it's disgusting, and it's unfair, and I'm pretty sure nearly all lesbians and bi women have gone through or are going through like a lot of internalized issues about sex and our physical desires because of it, because we're so used to seeing ourselves reduced through this lens. Like we're so used to thinking that our own desires are like disgusting and dirty. Yeah. yeah. Like, in fact, I think 
the people who made this movie were very aware of this because the reading scenes in this movie where we learn that Hidoko is being sexually abused, they were like specifically designed in a way in order to reveal that abuse is happening in a way that still wasn't gratifying to any possible creeps no. watching the movie because I'm very glad they did this because I think the only thing worse than a film's lesbian sex scenes being taken out of context for male pleasure is when a movie's sexual assault scenes are taken out of context mm. for male pleasure. I do think lesbians and bi women who raise these concerns about this are extremely valid, but also I think so-called feminists outside of our community trying to tell the world and trying to tell us that we can only exist for the male gaze is really homophobic and the last thing that we need. Yeah, and also like white feminists that say that that sort of enforce that idea we only exist for the white gays as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's an important aspect of this movie is, like, there's no white person in this movie. There's no – there's not a character – like, it's not made for white people in any way. It's not for you. Like, it's not for you. Like, you can still enjoy it. Yeah, Um, of course. Yeah. But it's not written – I feel like something I think every year with any award ceremony is that the real winner for every award ceremony is the white gays. Yeah. Because there's never – there's rarely, I should say, a film with a non – White gays, G-A-Z-E? Yeah, G-A-Z-E. Sorry. (laughs) Is the white gays – like with the with the Z and the E. Yes. Um, Because, like, there's so rarely a film – that mm-hmm. is, you know, completely absent of whiteness. And it's so yeah. weird when when there are films like that recognized in those categories. Like it's all kind of like about like the white people's approval. Yes. You see this with, with Parasite, Parasite. Um, yes. this year. Um, and you see it with uh, you saw it with Moonlight. You as saw it well. with Roma. There's always kind of like this one diversity wild card in the mix. Yeah, and it's like the film is not for you, it's not about you, and but you, they feel the need to be like, well, it's almost like their praise is the way they are, they make it about them, you know? Uh-huh. Like yeah. like even like I've read Even if it means completely misunderstanding yeah. the core essence. It's kind of like how you you meet those film boys that are like, "Oh yes, I love Asian cinema." Um, you know, and they'll say like one movie. Well, I'd say like It's like when you meet a straight guy, it's like, "Oh yeah, I love Fight Club." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The white gaze, G A Z E. Mm-hmm. Like, I think uh, one that's one thing I like about this movie is that there's no white character that helps them. There's not even like a little white comic relief. Ca- like, it's all yeah, of course. they're all Korean. No way, no way. One like, thing, one funny thing that Director Park did say about this film while doing press, people were like, "Oh wow, this is like the most dialogue any of your films has ever had." And he's like, "Oh, that's interesting." He's like, "Oh, that's true." He's and then he kind of went on about Stoker, which he'd done in 2013, which is, you know, it's an American movie with an all-white cast. And he's like, "I think maybe it's because I missed Korean in my films. Like I missed like the uh... language in my films because even though I I liked working on this movie, it like all the English made me uncomfortable." Sort of. Oh. So, <laughs> so yeah, that that's was nice. Yeah. But um, returning to my thing, I'm only I'm only halfway through my time. Well, keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. So Fingersmith, the novel it's based on, and The Handmaiden, they both make some really good points about pornography and how it can influence our sexual behaviors. Yes. When this one came out, it was sort of funny the way that some people were like, this is so unrealistic. Like, lesbians don't actually scissor. And um, I think it's really absurd because – one, there's no set criteria of, like, correct lesbian sex positions dictated for every lesbian or bi woman to follow. Like, it's different for everyone, and um, it's all about personal preference and what you and your partners want to do. So I thought it was really weird that some people – I distinctly remember a review by a professional film critic – whom I shall not name, but she's a white lesbian who did a review for The Handmaiden for a certain very popular Just news website. Just name and shame <laughs> Just do it. No, I'm not going to. I won't. In which she said that she didn't believe in scissoring. <laughs> and well, that's I, your business. I, I, remember, I remember reading and thinking, that's an extremely personal thing that's to say. That's none of our business. <laughs> like, it's an extremely personal thing to reveal about yourself, like, in a publication, but okay. <laughs> um... But yeah, I feel this says a lot about lesbian sex as a whole is that no one talks about it or like before this film at least. So sadly, when you're first starting out, your only point of reference is pornography and it's pornography that wasn't meant for us. Um, No, no, no. It's made for men. And it's often the case that this pre-existing knowledge that we have, um, it comes from graphic content that we shouldn't have been exposed to, but still internalized at a young age. 
And it's like, often like it's a very traumatized thing when you yes. come across, you're very tra- you're like oh like is yeah, this what and, it's meant to be and yeah this is very relevant to Hideko and Maud. So like even in privacy with another woman it still feels like you're performing. It's like that Margaret Atwood quote like male fantasies male, male fantasies. fantasies. You are a woman with a man inside you watching a woman you are your own voyeur. Like the scenes in the book and the movie are funny because these women know they're performing. You know how in part 1 you have not the full scene, but you see the way Hidako is acting, like she's acting very like, oh, I don't know what sex is. What no. what do a man and a what? woman do on their what? wedding night? What? Yes. And then in part two, you realize that, you know, she, of course she knows because she's been reading all this pornography her yeah. entire life. And um, in the book, it's really funny as well, because like she's deliberately being naive. She's like, oh, this worked in the porn that I read. So <laughs> <laughs> like she's deliberately being coy so that Suki or Sue will take yeah. the initiative to mm. show her. Well, yeah. it worked. <laughs> it worked. You know, it's oh, kind of she... like, well, if I have to be exposed to porn, then I'm going to use it to my advantage. Yeah. Good for her. Stylistically as well, the lesbian gaze is communicated through point of view shots and also like the symmetrical positions. Oh, which yeah. Were, um... The point of view shots. Yeah. <laughs> They're so funny. They're, honestly... They're actually like hilarious. Oh my God. I don't even know how anyone could find them sexy because it's just so funny that someone stuck a camera there. Like, yeah. Like, that's... <laughs> that's my I... thought. I just want to know how they – I just want to actually – is there, like, someone – did someone film – I know that someone wouldn't have because obviously that's not the point. But, yeah. like, honestly, I would pay to see how that was filmed, like, <laughs> yeah. to be a fly on the wall just from a technical perspective. How was that done? Because it's honestly – the angles are really funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, And, yeah, you know, there, there are also the symmetrical positions as well. Um, And I think – those were choreographed like specifically to symbolize those two women as equals. Mm. Um, like just before the scene, I should also note that Hideko has just done a reading of a lesbian pornographic text, The Sound of Bells. And uh, during that reading, you can see that she herself is aroused by the text and she's like dabbing sweat from yeah, the forehead. She's like, Ooh. And even when the electricity goes out, like mid performance, she closes her eyes and she just keeps going because she's obviously memorized it. And then when it's over and she goes back to her bedroom. Hit a coach, like she's actually visibly doing some of the yeah. things. Uh, like, like there's with a, the parallel that have been specifically mentioned, like in the sound of bells, like with the biting of the shoulder and stuff. Mm. Um, and then there's the final scene where they actually have the bells. Mm. So um, yeah, I remember reading an interview the screenwriter did where she said her lesbian friends like told her to include the scissoring because according to them, it was quote unquote the best one. Again, that must be personal preference, but also she deliberately didn't include like any positions that could represent like either of them as being like a top or a bottom because like they were worried that like heterosexual audiences would try to translate that into like, she was like verse rights. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, cause you know, like there's so many, like, so she didn't want people to be like, Oh yeah. So she's the man in this relationship. But it's she, cause they're yeah. both tops. I don't know. You can't tell. The whole point is that you can't tell from this movie which one they're they are. They're both scammers. They're both tops. Okay. I've decided. Yeah. They they are top like in life. In life. <laughs> in life. In life. They are the top of life. <laughs> yeah. That's my argument that those scenes actually aren't male gazy. Sarah Waters herself is quite happy with those scenes. So I think if the author of the book it's based on is fine, that should be enough for you. Yeah. <laughs> Personally though, like whenever I rewatch those scenes, I do skip those scenes anyway because that's none of my business. Yeah. Though it is, they are quite funny anyway. Like, they are funny. Yeah, I like, think you watch them the, once and that's The like dialogue fine. is really funny. They specifically wanted this sex scene to have like a lot of talking, like more than usual, because it's so uncommon. Um, I also think yeah. that's nice though, because like yeah. there's like, it's a very unhealthy thing that's always mm-hmm. portrayed that like nobody communicates yeah. during sex. Like, yeah. nah, in real it's, life, like that's all, like you do that a lot. You gotta, that like. That was like the biggest problem with Blue, Blue is the Warmest Color. It's like, why would you do that to a girl without on the asking? First date? <laughs> without asking. Without asking. <laughs> like, horrible conditions of the actresses aside like why would you do that consent is the warmest color really you know i feel yeah consent is the warmest color yeah Yeah. but no i can i can i say though like it is one of my favorite tropes Mm -hmm. when one person like person a is Mm -hmm. to person b i don't know how to kiss like you'll have to show me (laughs) 
it is literally one of my favorite tropes. It is so funny and it's usually very cute. Yeah. Um, if not, it's either very cute or just very awkward, mm-hmm. like, which I love both. Both outcomes are good. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know. I I generally, as I previously said, I don't generally like watching sex scenes in movie. I have mm-hmm. the same attitude. It's none of my business, really, yeah. and. I don't feel like nine times out of ten, in fact, 9.5 out of ten times out of ten, it doesn't need to be there. It doesn't need to be there, no. But, no, I do like the – I do like how they're talking, though. I think that's very yeah. cute and very – And they're really funny. And also, like, the way that that scene, it cuts to Hinako's – she's having an art class, and then you see her drawing, and it's <laughs> – it's the shittiest drawing. No, it's so bad. <laughs> it's so funny. I remember watching this for the first time, like in in the cinema, and like everyone was just like everyone was like really quiet during the sex scene, and I was like losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, what? I was like, I don't. And then you know the drawing pops up, like it's... the camera pants, like it goes from they count perfect little profiles of, of Suki and then it goes to Hitako's shitty drawing. <laughs> I think it's a good tension it's so, release. Yeah, exactly. Like it's... it's a good tension release. It's like. It's, it's time to not be sexy now. Yeah, it's giving you the permission, like, to just yeah. laugh for a second to yeah. get that, like... Because, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like everyone feels a bit stupid when you're watching yeah. a sex scene. You're just like, okay, uh, I'm watching this, I guess. Uh, this is what I'm looking at. But, yeah, so, I don't know. As far as sex scenes goes, it's not the worst one yeah. <laughs> that you could watch. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I didn't know that thing about them specifically picking positions. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Wish more movies... Like, Everything's symmetrical. That's, I, I did notice that, yeah. but I didn't think about that being mm. the result. Do you know it's what I mean? It's supposed to be about equality. Also, because this movie is also about class. Suki is, she's a Korean peasant, basically. Mm. And Hidako is, like, a lady. I like the way that the movie, like, tricks you with this. And, but, like, and sort of, like, in the extended version, you see at the start, like, you see her leave the town that mm-hmm. she's living in and everyone's crying like it should have been me and you're yeah. like oh like and if you haven't seen it you didn't mm-hmm. know you'd be like oh she's leaving and she's clearly very poor yeah. and she's going you know she's been chosen she's wearing the best she's, clothes she she's has. wearing the best clothes she has and she's been chosen to work in this fine household and mm-hmm. you think like oh wow this is probably the opportunity of a lifetime for her which i guess in a way it, it is it is, it is but not for lifetime. the reasons you think yeah. uh and you know she gets there and i don't know i think i personally think that the extended version does like shows that class yeah disparity a bit clearer mm-hmm. or i mean it is there in the film it film. is there but like, i think all those scenes but the way that they order it yeah the different. way that they order it uh, which brings me to the next thing I want to ask you, because obviously I only watched the extended version last night for the first time. Yeah. But you've seen both mm-hmm. multiple times. What are the differences, obviously, and do you have one that you prefer? In general, when I'm telling people to watch this movie for the first time, I tell them to watch the theatrical version, only because the pacing is... Like, when you don't know what's going on in this movie, the pacing is better for the theatrical version. Then I tell them to watch the extended version if they liked it. Um, and, of course, they liked it. In the extended version, we don't actually find out that Kusuki is a scammer until the count first arrives at the house. You find out in the first 10 minutes of the theatrical cut. So you kind of just have this half hour of Suki and Hidako, like, spending time together. And, ooh, it's a bit gay. I wonder if this is just going to be, like, a... Oh, like a like a maid, like, falls in love with her with the lady that she's waiting on and mm. you know there's she's doing up all these little buttons and mm. <laughs> and dressing I mean, up her and, yes, and, mm. and yeah it's very you know you know that that one tweet that's like in a period drama it's like miss can i can i undo all of these like tiny little buttons down the back of your dress it's like me not breathing <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you think it's gonna be that and then it turns out shocking to us suki is a scammer <gasps> um and then even more shocked to us here is a scammer <gasps> And then they scam together. I know. And it's lovely. It's it's so great because every time you think the plot twists are done in this movie, mm-hmm. there's one more. Like yeah. When you think you know. Yeah. When you think you know. It's like, oh, you, you think don't. you know what this movie is? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's really fun. And I I didn't expect. Really I didn't know anything about this movie. I just knew you were obsessed with it, mm-hmm. and you gave it to me to watch. And it took me ages to come around for because at that time I still yeah, wasn't yeah. used to watching like non English films. Um, so I had to. I usually had to build up to them because I'd yeah. be like, right, I've got to sit down. I've got to really read and yeah. blah, blah blah. So I went. I think it was like forty five degree day, and I went down to my auntie's house because my auntie's got sweet, sweet air conditioning. <laughs> And she was away, so I and I have a key to her house, so I just went down there, 
sat in the aircon, turned on my laptop, put on the handmaiden. I had no idea what I was in for, really. I knew it was gay because obviously I was like, if this is Dee's favourite movie, it's got to be gay. Um, <laughs> so I knew that. But, like, every time, like, I remember actually pausing it at the bit where, you know, they turn – well, you think that they've mm-hmm. turned on uh, Suki uh, and they've yeah. left her at the mental – yeah. Asylum. Uh, the end of part one. The end of part one. Like, I remember pausing and going, no, no, I don't yeah. want to watch this movie. That was like, like, no. I was like, no, I don't want to watch this movie. I remember actually getting up. I went mm-hmm. to make myself a cup of tea because I was like, oh, what the heck is this movie? Mm-hmm. Like, no. And then I was like, okay, sit back down, let's watch. And then, of course, that part part two is hot. Like, that part is horrible. It's a horror movie. So I was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. This is terrible. Yeah. This is terrible. And I kept waiting, like, oh, my God, but when am I going to find out what happened? This? I was like, don't tell me it ends there. But then, like. What do you know? know? What do you know? Uh, uh, it's like I love that about that. I think that's my favorite part about this. Yeah. Even more so than the the romance for me. Mm-hmm. I love a good yeah. I love a good scam. I love a good scam. I love the. Yeah. I kind of love like this is one of the things about my my favorite things about the Ocean's Eleven movie is how mm-hmm. like this movie plays with your perspective, mm-hmm. and I love movies yeah. that play with that. So like I love I love um I love especially because this movie is in two parts and you kind of see a replay of everything from Hitoko's perspective the second time and like it has different angles so you it can does. kind of see like the sly way that Hitoko is like watching Suki when she doesn't know and also like that that test that Hitoko does when they first meet like she writes on that piece of paper like can you read that to like really test her and actually like what Hitoko has written is actually like Suki's real name and she's written it she's like are you sure you can't read this like <laughs> I love that, and um, yeah, they're just real. They're both like just really interesting characters. Yeah, like, I love women. Like, yeah, um, like, like, did you know women have minds? Women have minds. We, women have women minds. have minds. And um, and I'm so sick. Shut up. <laughs> I'm gonna be a professional Saoirse Ronan in Little Women. <laughs> um, in Little Women impersonator, <clears throat> and I'm just adapting that one line for everything. Yeah. We were in Coles the other night, and I was like, I'm so sick of not mm-hmm. being able to find the lamb. <laughs> In this cult, <laughs> but yeah, I love, I love, I love these two characters. Like Suki is just really fun. Like she's obviously a con artist, a thief, a savior who came to ruin my life. Like she's really funny. And one thing that I do prefer about the theatrical version over the extended cut, because you find out later in the extended cut. That Suki is a scammer, you lose all her little voiceover comments you that do. happen in the beginning. So it's really funny, like when she's like, those fuckers. Like, I yes. give a breath, like to, to all these things. And when she's like, oh, when, when, when she's in the madhouse, I'll have these earrings for myself. Like, yes. stuff like that. Like, it's really funny. And you lose I, that in the Yeah, I version. felt like, you know, I love so, yeah, the narration. Like, I yeah. like my favorite narration is when in the theatrical version, when she sees. Hit a code for, for the first, first time, time. and, and she's, she's like, "Bloody hell! She should. He didn't tell me she was so pretty." <gasps> it's like, "Oh, gay." The 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 Bola yeah, okay. energy. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. I love Hitoko because it's so awful what's happened to her, and she's a character where you can very clearly see all her motivations, mm. like through through the trauma that she's experienced. She's not even like totally virtuous before it you can see how she herself is corrupt like she yes is, she's actually very she's very violent, violent yeah like, in the first part of the movie where she's just acting innocent and naive around Suki, and then you see just how violent she is herself and how cruel it has made her yeah and you kind of see that in the book as well like how Maud chooses just to let sue be locked up and mm. like not help her how Maud chooses to just keep going through with that. I, um, I like how in part one, mm-hmm. when Hideko hits Suki, you're like mm. very shocked. You're mm. like, oh my God, like she just hit her. Yeah. Like, And then when you watch part two and you yeah. realize like she, she hits she people. She hits everyone. Like she hits everyone. Um, and, it's, it, it's very much you know. like, oh, like, all right. You, like she, she, like you yeah, realize like, like she genuinely very... snapped in that mm-hmm. moment. Which is interesting, you're like, of all the, like, most of those scenes, like, mm-hmm. you, you feel like, oh, it's revealing how much of a liar, um, yeah. <laughs> like, that she was being, but then... How much when, of a rotten bitch she is. <laughs> but when you see, like, how violent she is, it actually shows you, like, how hurt she actually was, yeah. like, in the scene where she hits And the Suki. stuff that she goes through herself as well. Of course, like, yeah. Oh my god, when her uncle, like, hits her hand with the beads, <gasps> um, that's so fucked up. And, and her like, auntie is just standing there. Yeah, oh no, her, her auntie, what's her name? Yeah, 
Her uncle's wife. Her uncle's previous wife is yeah. just standing there laughing. Messed up. Yeah, like he, he hits her with the beads and then you're reminded when Suki was going through her stuff, she finds that exact clothing that she was wearing that day. So she's kept it there in that, like at the bottom of the drawer the whole time, like with the beads attached. Yeah, and, and, and she drops it on the floor. Yeah, and she drops it on the floor and she's like, what the fuck is this? Um, So she's actually like held on to all these things. And then I guess it's kind of a symbolic thing that... <laughs> That she has the bells at the end of the movie, which yeah, I, was, look I like wasn't those. gonna say it because I don't, you know, yeah, I, to each their own is yeah, all I will to say. To each their own, to each their um, own. So it's kind of like she's taken a lot of the things that have been used to hurt her, um, and she's kind of found her own empowerment in it. Yeah, I guess. and now they're gonna like, give even, her pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like it's. It's not in like a, oh, yeah, this is happy now that it's like that. It's also messed up because it still shows yeah, like, that, that it's from that. That is part of her. Um, and, yeah. you know, like even like the the rod that her uncle beats her with, that's the thing that Suki uses to like, smash the snake sculpture mm-hmm. at the end. But what I also love about this movie is how pretty it is. It's gorgeous. It is so pretty. Oh my goodness. Like honestly, even if you even if I had no idea what they were saying, mm-hmm. I would still watch this movie yeah. because it is beautiful. Yeah, like in all the technical categories, it's amazing. I love the score so much. Oh. Fantastic. It makes me so happy. <laughs> it is beautiful. And just the costuming, mm-hmm. the attention to detail. I mean, I don't know what fashions were like yeah. having being not alive in the nineteen thirties in yeah. Korea. It's very difficult for me to ascertain mm-hmm. how correct it but it looks stunning. It looks like there was so much detail. Mm-hmm. Just all of it. Every shot I feel like is like a postcard from another time and it's yeah. it's lovely. First of all, I want to ask you, what's your favorite costume? And then I want to ask you, what is your, like, favorite shots of the movie Mm -hmm. and and why? Aesthetically, I really love the green dress Mm -hmm. that she's wearing when the count is first, like, yo, let's, we should, we should work something out. It's really cool. Like, the design is really interesting. Like, you think it's just a regular shoulderless dress, but actually there's, like, mesh going up to her neck and at the back there's a shot of her back and it's like buttons like in the mesh that are green going down her back like into the dress i thought that was really cool stunning Mm -hmm. her wedding was really nice like just the design on that is really intricate i like the way that this film repeats costumes yeah that was my favorite like when you see the aunt in the reading in the white kimono and then you see hideko wearing it again yep 10 years later that's uh, it's it's gross but like yeah that's it's there. also very foreboding mm-hmm. when when you learn what it's happens very to, the, like, to the aunt yeah it's, it's very foreboding i also love the use of gloves in this movie a lot as well oh, nice. especially you'll notice hideko is wearing black gloves when she's being like deceptive especially oh especially in the third part of the movie like when, when she's with the count and he's assuming that they've just locked up Suki. She's wearing black gloves the whole time. I did not know this. Yes. Oh my god, that's so cool. Yeah, it's really it's really fun. Um and just stuff like that. I if love you look that. at like the the colors of the gloves that she's wearing and like what it means. There are things, so yeah. many gloves. Like that scene where she opens the drawers and they're all color coded. Yeah. I I lose I lost my mind. Mm-hmm. I was like who does that? But also mm-hmm. like I love it as well. Yeah. Um my favorite scene in the movie, which is the library destroying scene. I actually think that's the most romantic scene in cinematic history. Like the way that the music swells and the way that Suki is just like so immediately like I'm going to fucking destroy everything. Like they take all these symbols of the male gaze and like everything that was used to her that and they destroy them. And I just think like there's nothing more romantic than that. I also think like, it's it's made more romantic as well by the fact that <coughs> Suki like never saw any yeah, of this. Yeah, Suki never like, saw she, any of this. She just sort of deduces from yeah. being in that room and from she, talking like, she, to Hideko that yeah, this like, has happened to Hideko her. Hideko hands the book over to her and, she, and Suki's like, look, I can't even read Japanese. Um, and then she keeps turning the pages and then you see that awful painting of the octopus, which is a real painting. And um, she sees the painting and she's like, oh, this is what you've been forced to to read this whole time yeah and then just like zero to 100 she starts destroying the yeah. whole library she and just like hideko kill bill fire and, and hideko joins in too and it's just it's so lovely and then there's that shot 
of them just running across the green yeah, the and music they're laughing and, scene, and this and ah oh. oh, that was like that's my favorite shot in the whole movie when, when they're running when they're just running yeah. like it makes me so happy because they are so happy they're like really high off like what they've destroyed basically <laughs> and yeah. um, they're together and they've escaped like it's it's lovely and um i think that was the moment where i was like this is the best movie ever <laughs> it is it is it so is. fulfilling like that moment it's so fulfilling were you ever afraid watching this movie that mm. it would have a sad ending like uh, it, yeah 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 um i mean when part one ends i'm like i was like devastated i was like oh damn they really are going through with this like she really is going through with this scam damn it like when they're driving Hidako to the hospital and then you know she gets grabbed and that track plays the betrayal they also play that same track when Suki catches Hidako kissing the count mm. um, oh, as they well. Do, so think. it's like it's yeah. like the betrayal of that moment is there as well. Yeah, so I was like, oh, God, how is this going to end? It didn't feel particularly long. It's only like 40 minutes part one in the theatrical version. You know better than I do. For maybe less than 40 minutes. It's not that long. So I'm like, this can't be the end of the movie. And then you switch immediately to Hidako's perspective. No, I didn't yeah. think it would be the end of the movie, mm-hmm. but like yeah, maybe the this... end of the story because, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with the sad ending and like you see all of this and like where they've led up to. And then, you know, there's the scene where Hidako like, does try to kill herself because she doesn't want to go through with it at all anymore. Like she's not even, like she's not, she doesn't even care that her uncle will get all her money. She just wants to end it because she knows that she loves Suki so much that she just wants to and also like she... look at her life yeah like, look at her life like she wa- she was going to do that in the first place but then the count was like no the... don't kill yourself your assets are so sexy but yeah. the whole reason <laughs> like... like but doesn't she make a deal with him to give her the opium so yeah, that, she, yeah. she makes a deal with him for well, him to give her the opium like if she agrees to basically hand over all her money to him in this elaborate scam mm. so like and all be all like regardless of that like Hidako like she wanted to die yeah. and then you know there is that scene like at the cherry tree where her aunt killed herself and you know she's dropped and then Suki catches her and it's like the most relieved that I've ever felt in all Say, of it I remember literally <sighs> can you imagine me sitting 45 uh-huh. degrees on my auntie's couch I know <laughs> yeah. I was just like oh this is too much <laughs> Yeah, in part one, when Hidoko pushes Suki out of the scene, you don't see Hidoko's face. You just see their feet and them pushing, and then you see just, like, the back of Hidoko's head mm. as she's pushing her out. But at this scene, like, you see it's an amazing performance from Kim in here where she's so angry and she's so she's so heartbroken just, like, pushing her out. And so, like, when she reaches, like, for the box, which you know has the rope in it because yeah. Suki found it earlier, it's like, no! no. And then... <sighs> but it's and okay. Then, yeah, but then it's okay. I mean, it's not okay because when Suki finds out, like, she's, like, she's being scammed, she drops. She's like, oh. Hidako, she's like, that fucking son of a bitch. And she's like, <laughs> it's, it's actually it's so, so funny it's though. So I burst dark, out like, laughing. Like, it's really dark, but it's so funny. Um, and she's like, oh, wait, sorry, miss. And then, yeah, um, it's. But God, I love this movie. do you think, though, that's why some people dismiss this movie? Because it is happy? Mm. Like, because I feel like sometimes, and we'll talk about this more in a future episode, but Mm -hmm. I think sometimes gays will dismiss a movie that has a happy ending. Gays will dismiss movies with sad endings too. Yeah. It's like, it's Gays be dismissing movies. I think a lot of people, when, even me, like, trying to get people to watch this movie, I was like, it has a happy ending. And people like, oh, shit, got to watch this movie. Because we were so used to seeing really sad stories. So I really love, like, the, it shouldn't be escapism, but it is. Of, like, some lesbians getting a happy ending and getting everything that they wanted. I think um, it's a... I personally think it's a realistic ending for what hmm. for what happens. I I yeah, mean, they they is. still have to live in relative hiding yeah. because they... They still have to live in hiding, you know, but, like, they got many. They got many. Yeah. They got um, their dollar dollar bills. Yeah. But, yeah, like, I think it's a very happy ending. Yeah. Um and it's beautiful. Like, it's a very satisfying ending. One thing that I do like as well is that... The uncle gets the uncle, murdered! The, no, the uncle and the count, like, they kill themselves. Mm-hmm. Because, because like, first off, like, the uncle is, like, torturing the count, first of all. This is where, like, some people who were, like, who were, like, dumb were like, oh, now I see how Park Chan directed this film. Because, you know, this guy's having uh. his fingers p- taken off. 
these are the people that are like, oh, Park Chan-wook is the is the Asian is the Argentina. Asian Queen in Jardim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's, it's, and so you have that. Like they are destroying each other, and then obviously they die from the the mercury from the mercury in the cigarette. cigarette. Yeah, and I like that because prior to that scene, you when he opens his case, you mm. see the blue. There's yeah. the blue colored cigarettes, and there's the white yeah, colored cigarettes. Yeah, the normal, cigarettes. and then he puts all the normal ones in his mouth, yeah. so that those are the only ones left. You also see the blue cigarettes like earlier in the scene, like with um. Like when it's just the uncle and the count talking as well. Mm. Even though I hate that scene, like that's a nice detail that they set up. Yeah, yeah. The foreshadowing in this movie yeah. is fantastic. Everything, everything is just tight. In, like the narrative is just tight in this movie. Like mm. there's not a drop of spilled ink. Nope. Even in the way that Hidako and the count talk to each other, it's kind of like I love those both, scenes. They're both like making fun of each other. In um in the book, the count does know. Like gentleman does know that what is a lesbian like he he figures it out kind of like i thought he figured it out here though. <clears throat> no he didn't because he genuinely thought that hitoko was putting the moves on him <laughs> but, oh right <laughs> like yeah and it's kind of he's kind of mean to her though so it's like eh. yeah but um it's so funny to me that he's like mm. thinking of her when he dies it's like <sighs> bro she don't care about bro, you she doesn't care about you like you're literally thinking of her and she's holding hands with her girlfriend they're doing they're doing the shoulder resting the mm. iconic gay shoulder resting. Gays be just resting their heads mm-hmm. on, yeah. on their lovers' shoulders. They do. But yeah, so they destroy themselves. It'll go until you trash the library, but like the men destroy themselves. Yeah. And, you know, not that, you know, I'm I'm all for like murderous women in stories. Just but killing, I like that they killed abuse, themselves. But, but I, like that, I like that they didn't do that in this. They were kind of just like, they kind of just washed their hands of them. Yeah. You know? You know, like you call it a revenge like movie, mm-hmm. but I think it's not, it's not, you know, it's like in Beyonce, always stay gracious, best revenge is your papers. <laughs> yes. Like like it's literally that. Like it's like it's them not yeah. being like we're gonna plot and murder. Like it's not like in say, I don't mm-hmm. know, I'm, I'm using this as an example though, they're not really comparable films. Mm-hmm. But it's not like in Thoroughbreds, you know, yeah. where she's like, Yeah, we're gonna kill my horrible stepdad because mm-hmm. he's done all this shit to me. Like it's literally like, you know, <laughs> we're gonna get out of here, like, you know. Mm-hmm. And I I like that, you know. But okay. I wanna ask you why do you love this story? Like, I don't want you to tell me why it's good. Mm-hmm. I want you to tell me why you love it. Okay, why well, I love this story. Yeah. Why does it speak to you? And why do you think at, when you watched it at that point in your life and when you watch it now that it still is just so, like, you love it so much? Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm a dyke with taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Um, that's the short answer. The short answer. Um, but... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like never has a movie ever been so satisfying with pretty much everything, like all the kind of tropes that I love yeah. are in one movie. Like it's gay. It's made by Park Chan-wook. Um, there's a scam. There's a bunch of plot twists. Like It's I a guess, period piece. Yeah, it's a period piece. <laughs> it criticizes colonialism. Nice. Um, yeah, true. Like, you know, they're hot. <laughs> they're hot they're funny they're really well written like yeah i guess that's that's why it's good though it's not really why well i guess because i've never really seen a story like this before i don't think i like romances so much actually like really? I, I don't think i don't think i'm that into romances like i feel like most of my other favorite films really aren't romances for instance if you look at children of men and marlena and mm. I'm not into stories which are kind of just romances. I'm into stories which have more than that to say. And I think this story definitely does that. Like, this story says a lot about trauma. Um, It says a lot about just things that I care about. Like, for instance, the male gaze. Like, for instance, trauma. Like, this is, in some ways, it is quite personal to me. Yes. So, yeah. And, like, I'd never seen a film before like that that really like legit ticked all the boxes yes. <laughs> um like even though even like, the octopus being there like even though i hated seeing it it was horrifying for me it was like a sign i'm like this movie is like for me but it, but it's also a horrifying thing in the movie. yeah it's a horrifying thing in the movie like it's not yeah. there to be like oh, this isn't this a gorgeous octopus <laughs> isn't this literally this... when does that happen <laughs> uh Check of water. yeah no, not really. For me, even though I know it isn't, even though I know there are lesbians who are actually Korean that like love this film even more, who must love this film even more than me. But like, but it doesn't have to speak. Yeah, to but you it doesn't have that, to speak to me reason. like so specifically for that yeah. reason. Like it was just, it was just, it was just nice. 
So yeah, I am number one handmaiden stand, and I love that. That's like my rap. I love no, internet. that is your rap on the internet. Like um, literally, as soon as we started, like announced this podcast, people were asking you like when you were going to talk about this yeah. movie. I was like shocked actually that in our earlier episodes, like we'd gone like four episodes and I hadn't mentioned the handmaiden once. And I was like, when I realized that, I was like, oh my god. Not like, till oh like, good job. And then I and that's why when we did our Goldfinch episode, like I snuck it in. <laughs> That it was like a good adaptation of a long book. Oh, that's all. That's right. like I just had to mention it because I didn't yeah, realize. I, felt, I, I, didn't, like I mean, I suppose why service. would we mention it in mm-hmm. Good Omens? Why would we mention yeah, it? Yeah, why would we mention it there? But like, yeah, we had no reason to mention it. But like, it's shocking that I would embark on I making know. a podcast and not <laughs> talk about this. Um, but, but yeah, we're giving the people what they want. Yeah, and also giving you what you want. Yeah, um, like this has been so fun. I'm glad. So I feel like I feel like once this is done, like I'll remember, I'll realize. Oh, I forgot to say this. I've got to say this. So I don't know. Can we do a part two if I do? If there's yeah, that sure. Much stuff? We can yeah. we can record. Let's do more that. Let's if do you that. think of anything, um, <laughs> um, but I do have one more question for you because, mm-hmm. like, I do wonder. You like, th- there's no such thing as a perfect gay film, mm-hmm. but do you think this comes close? Um, I think this is a perfect gay film. Oh, you think it is? I genuinely think it is. Like, what's what's bad about it? Nothing. What more do you want? <laughs> like, <laughs> the thing about gay cinema is if it's centered on being gay, it gets a bit boring. Like, they kind of get a bit all the same. Like, those stories yeah. are important, obviously. Like, I think we should have different variations of the same stories told as much as, you know, straight people get those stories told. Yeah. But, like, I love that this had actual plot um, and... Even though it doesn't focus on them being gay, like them being gay is just like so intrinsic to the story. Yes. Um. So that's why. It's but so it's lovely. all. But it's also like it's just good that it's two women. I also, yeah, that's right. And I also love that it's a posit- It's actually a positive thing in the movie. Yeah, it is a know? positive thing. And in they the never movie. really. I mm-hmm. mean, not in a direct, overt way, mm-hmm. treated like homophobic. Like, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's. The whole trauma that is happening with them is that you know with her child abuse, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not about the homophobia that no, because no, there isn't really actually that much homophobia. There homophobia. isn't though. There isn't at all. Like not really. even in the book, there is. Even the count when I don't know. Yeah, the I count feel like know. I feel like I don't know, but sometimes I feel like he sort of suspects it. Mm. He suspects that she's gay because he's just like for a man to seduce you would be, and then he opens the door, she's like impossible. Yes, like that's right. I kind of interpreted that as him thinking that she's so desensitized to mm. to anything to do with sexuality that she could never be seduced like given what she's been exposed to true in the book there is a lot of homophobia from gentlemen towards Maud. i kind of love the way that the book is the word queer it's like it's winking at you because obviously queer didn't mean that back then like oh, where, right. where it's set but it's like you know sarah waters is just like winking at you like in the <sighs> meantime because what specifically like when she uses queer to mean odd is yeah like that there are also a few instances in the movie where it feels like it is specifically winking at lesbian audiences because especially got that from the lilies the like the water lilies that you see throughout the film maybe people don't know but like a lot of asian lesbians use water lilies as kind of like a symbol as kind of like a signifier like that you know that they're part of that community so you see water lilies in the bath scene and you also see them like on Hitoko's bedside table like for the sex scene as well so in that way it's kind of like the movie is winking specifically at Asian lesbians watching the movie that you know this is for us. I'm not saying that it's a good LGBT film because it doesn't have homophobia like I think I don't know sometimes it's nice that you don't have to deal with that shit when you're But because I think if you were dealing with all that on top of this Mm -hmm. you know and I feel like it's nice that that their relationship is like this island. And I think though like the story in itself is enough of a commentary on homophobia and like society's attitudes towards pornography and towards yeah and towards women's sexuality like it's still kind of there it's not like it doesn't exist it's Mm. not like the movie treats it like it doesn't exist yeah we were talking about how the handmaiden hasn't really won a lot of accolades um especially in the west some people are kind of mad to this day that the Academy never nominated it for Best Foreign Language Film. The way that the foreign language category, which is now called like the Best International Film category, works is that different countries will have a different board or like committee of government like to send it through. In South Korea, the Ministry of Culture selects 
a Korean film to submit to the Academy to become eligible for that particular category. And actually, at the time that The Handmaiden was released, Park Chan Wook was on a talent blacklist, oh. uh, where basically, like, his. Like he and a bunch of filmmakers and a bunch of artists and writers, they were on it um, because the government didn't believe that their work represented their values. So that's why he was blacklisted. So that's why none of his films like could ever have been submitted to it, including The Handmaiden, which is why they chose another film to submit. Their loss. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that actually, like, the thing is, a few months after the Oscars and everything, those ministers in South Korea actually got jailed for corruption. Ha! So that blacklist isn't in place. And so it's good to see South Korea submitting a lot more. Actually, like since that blacklist has been abolished, the only films that they've submitted have been from filmmakers from that blacklist. So they submitted... <laughs> it's like they, submitted, they were aware. It's like, <laughs> they were aware. It's like they've been making such good film for so long that they're finally getting that help. For instance, Burning by Lee Tae who was in the who was on the blacklist was submitted it didn't get nominated this year Parasite gets submitted and Bong Joon-ho he was on the blacklist previously mm-hmm. so yeah it's nice to see those things changing but yeah other than that like that's just for best foreign language I will never forgive basically any awards body for not nominating The Handmaiden for literally every other yes. category, especially the technicals. I think he'll suck <laughs> for doing that. Yeah, not to not to be not to be a bitch, but like I think The Handmaiden is actually so underrated. Yeah. Um, no, it is. Like, uh, like in general, like it's well known, like as as a very good film, but like I feel like it has a bit of a cult status, honestly. Yeah, it's. I think it will, like. Given people definitely want to see the film, but it's kind of it's not quite part of that canon yet. No, you know, and I want it to be, and I think especially within like the film gays G A Y S that like it should be more of you know kind of like how we all have like those mandatory watches that like oh everyone's got to watch this, everyone's got to watch this. Like I'm I'm just so sick. I'm just so I'm sick. just so sick of white lesbians telling me to watch fucking Carol. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. But I think you can see that mm. The Handmaiden has had an influence on films yeah. because um, I believe that Portrait of a Lady on Fire was yes! deeply influenced by this no, movie. No, oh my god, Portrait of a Lady, like I love Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I love I it love as its it. own original thing. I like, love no it. one loves this movie more than us, Yes, honestly. Nobody. Like, But also like I feel like Portrait of a Lady on Fire is The Handmaiden without plot. Yeah, it borrows a lot of plot beats, and they have like very similar confrontations between and them. very similar shots. There are yeah, like, a very there are similar very shots. similar as like yeah. shot for shot. Not mm-hmm. not like shot for shot. Like, not shot like, for shot, but, but there like, are very similar shots, and it's really nice. But you feel like, like Celine see... Sciamma, like like she's a fan yeah. of the Handmaiden, and she was like, "I can do this with some French bitches." I have no idea if she if she is though, because like in when she's talking about her influences, she hasn't mentioned it, so I don't know. Because I, if she really did, we would be like, we knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't actually know for sure, but like I think the visual similarities are undeniable, and there are some plot beats which are undeniably like very similar to the Handmaiden. Mm. Um, the dynamic is like, like the the dynamic is very similar, so it's really nice, and it's just like a beautiful film. Um, so I can't wait when I can purchase it very legally from a shop and me like, too I, and in this case like i actually, I actually mean that i'm going yeah. to purchase it legally from a shop Why, what did not you mean be- before shut up <laughs> <laughs> and in this case i actually mean that i'm gonna like purchase it legally from a shop and then yeah. i want to i want to be able to make some posts just with those visual similarities because that's all i could see yeah in fact like i probably wouldn't like portrait of lady on fire so, so much like if i didn't see those similarities from the handmaiden anyway so yeah, yeah. But I remember saying to you after I saw Portrait of Lane, you were saying to me, like, I can't wait to make, like, parallel (laughs) gifts. And I was saying to you, like, I feel like this is my, like, the love you have for The Handmaiden is the love I will have for this movie. Because I'm, I don't like, uh, I don't like, uh, like, the violence. Mm. Like, even though I know it's not, like, it's not a violent, the violence I'm not a fan of. And it's very dark. And, like, that whole, the part two is very horrific. Like, I like the reason I like Portrait of Lady, I'm a fan because it's just nice. It's just nice. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just nice. Yeah. And also, like... The Hemming is nice, but it's not just nice. It's not just so, nice. Yeah. But I'm a big fan of things. Like, I'm a big fan of the wholesome film genre. Yes. That, that's my whole yeah. thing. And so, like, for me, mm. that's why I personally, like, have a love a little bit greater for Portrait of Lady, but I also mm-hmm. love The Hemming. Yeah. Like, it is... And they're mm-hmm. both excellent. Yeah. But, you know... The Handmaiden ran so that 
Call Trevor Lady on fire. Could chill out on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yep. That's true. But do you have any final, like, thoughts, nuggets of wisdom about the hair maiden before we wrap this up? I don't know. Just, like, watch it. <laughs> Watch um, it. Watch it. Read The Fingersmith. You should tell everyone to watch The Handmaid. I think that. I said at the start of this podcast that I'm like a little bit scared when I to invite like straight people to watch this movie. But, you know, like this is. But I feel like if they have listened to us talk about it and mm. watch it, they will appreciate it differently to mm. if they just found it of their own accord. Mm. And I feel like a lot of people who you've recommended The Handmaiden mm. to, even like on your blog, usually come back and they're like, I love this movie. Yeah. That's you know? True. I've never seen anyone not do that. Yeah. Okay. Eventually we're going to do an episode on just like uh, LGBT period dramas. Yes. So if I've missed anything, let me know and we can talk about it in there. Yes. Yeah. There's like a bunch of stuff that we've already mentioned on this podcast that I want to revisit in this episode because, yeah. In the period drama. The, in the period drama yeah. episode, yeah. That's going to come up soon, but not next week. I don't know. What are we doing next week? What are we doing next week? Um, I mean, not, what are we doing next episode? New episode, next fortnight. We haven't decided yet what we'll do. So it'll be we haven't su- decided yet what we'll do. But um, but it's surprise, it'll be a surprise for you and it'll be a surprise for us. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for listening to Gay V Club. If you like us, please like, subscribe, rate, leave a nice review on wherever you listen to podcasts. Contact us on social media, Instagram and Twitter at Gay V underscore club. Yeah. Uh, we also have a YouTube for people who require closed captions. By the way, the DMs on our socials are open, so if you don't feel yeah, comfortable yeah. like openly adding us, like just yeah, just yeah, you can just just send slide us into a, those DMs. Slide into our DMs. Um, also, I'm thinking I'm starting to slowly ma- make my way back to Twitter. I had lots of time off because yes. I was finishing uni, and it was just too stressful to be on there and finishing yes. uni. But congratulations on finishing uni, by the way. Thank you, thank yeah. you. And, no, I don't um, think we mentioned that. On this I'm trying. I'm trying to f- apply for honors right now, but um, but like I finished my normal mm-hmm. degree, which is which is mm-hmm. good. Um, but yeah, I I went off Twitter for the last six months mm-hmm. of my degree because I was like, it's too much to be reading about the world and also trying to finish. Yeah. Finish uni um but i'm slowly like making my way back so Mm -hmm. hopefully i will be back on there but yeah you can find the links to our personal socials on the gay v club pages yes everyone go watch something nice be something nice be safe the handmaiden again go watch the handmaiden again with all the and keep in mind everything that i've said basically oh and don't watch it on netflix apparently because the subtitles are wrong on netflix the subtitles are really fucked up for some reason, I don't understand why. Like they didn't get the official subtitles that that were like released by CJ, and they just did their own again. I know Netflix has been known to do that, but yeah, they're really messed up. Just like the vocab is all wrong. So please acquire it legally from a shop somewhere yeah. else. Like actually, yeah, either acquire <laughs> um, it legally from a shop or acquire it legally from a shop if you can. I mean, mm, yeah, because yeah, I think that this film absolutely deserves that. Like mm-hmm. most of the films that we love that we talk about absolutely deserve that. So yeah, yes. All right, everyone, be good, and we will hear from you next time. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.